Hey there, welcome to another edition of my digital uh, auditory video salute to, in my opinion, the greatest writer of our generation, Neil Stevenson. Um, yeah, as I said in previous videos, he's got his latest book coming uh, very soon in, in hard copy. And uh, so in the lead up to that, I wanted to do a retrospective of, of all the books of his that I've had uh, encounters with. Um, it's not all, I, I haven't read actually all of his, I'll go back and read The Missing Ones at some point, um, but, uh, but these are the ones that I have read and uh, they've completely changed my life. I can't really imagine life without them. Um, so this is a salute to them. Last time we did uh, Cryptonomicon, well that gives us ch a chance to jump into these three books here. This is something known as the Baroque Cycle and we're going to knock it out in one episode. You may or may not be pleased to hear. And the reason is that it's a trilogy. Uh, you mustn't tackle these, in my opinion, without reading Cryptonomicon first. Uh, so Cryptonomicon is your, is your gateway. If you enjoy that uh, and you get into it, well then you get what I consider to be one of the great pleasures uh, of, of modern literature, which is the Baroque cycle of, of Neil Stevenson's masterpiece. So uh, why is it so good? Well, um, he, he talked about, in Cryptonomicon about the, the moment that humanity made the leap into the computing era. And it was the, um, the, the, crypt, the cryptographic, sorry, is that the even the right word? Cryptological, cryptographic um, war that was going on between the Axis powers and the allies during the war which only, which was during the Second World War, which actually only came to light, uh, I think in the 80s or 90s, it started to come to light because it was super, super top secret. Anyway, it changed our fundamental understanding of what had happened during the Second World War. And it was the moment that humanity made the leap into being able to produce digital computing, thanks to geniuses like Alan Turing, who features in the Cryptonomicon. Well, having tackled that question, um, Neil Stevenson decided to go further back in time and analyze even further the roots of these phenomena. Where does the mathematics come from that enables us to, to, um, to have computing nowadays? Um, what about money? Where does that come from? What about um, simple political uh, sort of... Uh, conflicts that we ha exist in nowadays. What's the root of them? Where did they come from? Where did our perception of, of self come from? Where did the enlightenment come from? Well, all of those questions and many, many, many more are dealt with in these three books. It's an astonishing achievement and we're going to do a bit of reading in a second. But first I wanted to just tell you the, let me see if I got it. I didn't really, oh yeah, here we go. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I wanted to just read the blurb on the back of the first one, Quicksilver. It, it, because it, even it, in my opinion, this, this, this writing is so good, it forced reviewers to bring out some of their best writing. And for me, this is one of my favorite, favorite little bit of capsule reviews of anything. It, it, as soon as I read this, I was like, yeah, I've got to read this. I was going to anyway, it was Neil Stevenson, but check this out. This is the Daily Telegraph's little review or extract from their review. A great heaving countryside of a book, massive in scope and littered with treasure. Quicksilver succeeds in being impressively entertaining over an impossible distance. This isn't a book. It's a place to move into and raise a family. You better start reading now. <laughs> and I agree with that totally. Um, it is, it is, uh, that massive in scale. And just look at the, the, look at how mine is falling apart. This isn't even the only copy I've ever owned, but again, like Cryptonomicon, I've read this at least 11, 10, 11 times. It's, it's amazing. I've read it to the point of destroying it. It's almost broken. I'm going to have to get a new copy. Um, and what, what sticks out to me, this isn't a book, it's a place to move into and raise a family. That really sticks out to me, that line. It's a beautifully written bit of, um, bit of prose. And it's so funny, I'm talking about the review on the back, not the actual writing. But um, 
I think there's something profound there because I learned so much about about my own history from reading these books. So much. I think it's a great historical primer. If I, I've sometimes contemplated trying to encourage someone, <laughs> some historian, to start a course which is purely based on reading these books, including Cryptonomicon, you could do it, and purely based on reading these books and, and just reveling in the joy of, of the historical events that are described, um, but comparing them to historical records that we have and, and separating the fact from the fiction, because there's, there's fantasy elements in here too. Um, but it's shocking how much of the most astonishing moments in these books is actually historically accurate because you just read it and you're like, this cannot have happened. This is absolutely astonishing. Turns out it did. Our, our, our best records show that, that the, the, some of these most astonishing events really did happen. And the basic journey that it describes is solid. Um, so it's a great historical primer. Okay, I've ranted enough. The reading that we're going to do, excuse me while I take a little H2O. The reading that we're going to do is actually from the second book, The Confusion, and I've tried to pick something that's not going to be too spoilery um, for you because there's a lot of joy in, in learning the journey of these characters. Um, the reason I've picked this one is it's kind of like, it just shows the writing on display. And so for a bit of context, um, the one of the main characters, Eliza, um, is engaged in a project in, in, in is engaged in a, in a sort of a piece of financial subterfuge um, where she's navigating in the world and she's not you know she's she's not a um, what's the word she's 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 not possessing power let's say she, she's not a warrior she's not a soldier um, she's not royalty um, and yet through her the sheer force of her intellect uh, she's able to navigate into the world uh, into the nascent world of, of, of finance, um, which is just coming about in this period. Um, so in this moment, just whack the keyboard, I want to see it's still working. In this moment, she has, um, through various adventures and misadventures, got to the point where she's having a, an amount of money signed over to the French crown, um, which is going to be to her advantage ultimately. It's very, 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 very complicated. Um, but I wanted to just focus on this bit of writing just so you can see the style and and again the strange angles that, that uh, Neil Stevenson approaches a scene from and how he um, produces intrigue but how he also just has a joy of the written word. So let's just listen and see how you go um, with it. And again, if my style of reading puts you off. Um, I hope that it won't get in the way of your enthusiasm to read this stuff. The quill swirled and lunged over the page in a slow but relentless three steps forward, two steps back sort of process and finally came to a full stop in a tiny pool of its own ink. Then Louis Philippot, the first Comte de Pontchartrain, raised the nib let it hover for an instant as if gathering his forces and hurled it backwards along the sentence, tiptoeing over eyes, slashing through T's and X's and nearly tripping over an umlaut, building speed and confidence while veering through a slalom course of acute and grave accents, pirouetting through sedillas and carving vicious snap turns through circumflexes. It was like watching the world's greatest fencing master dispatch 20 opponents with a single continuous series of manoeuvres. He drew his hand up with great care, lest his lace cuff drag in the ink. It inflated for a moment as it snatched a handful of air, then flopped down over his hand, covering all but the fingertips that pinched the pen and giving them an opportunity to warm up. Twin jets of steam unfurled from Pontchartrain's cavernous elliptical nostrils as he reread the document. Eliza realized she'd stopped breathing and released her own cloud of steam. As she emptied her lungs, her dress hugged her suddenly around the waist while relaxing its grip on her thorax. Some milk leaked out of her breasts, but she had anticipated this and swathed herself in cotton. 
it was most unusual for a virgin who had merely adopted an orphan to lactate. She smelled like a dairy, but the room was so cold that no one could smell anything but dust and ice. If you would, my lady, verify that I have not erred in setting down the principle. He withdrew his left hand from its warm haven between his thighs and gave the page a 180 degree rotation. Eliza stepped forward, trying not to push a vast front of milk scent before her and rested her hands on the marble tabletop, tabletop, then drew them back for the stone jerked the warmth from her flesh. Her arms were tired. Walking here through the corridors of the palace, she had had to lift up her skirts, heavy winter stuff, lest they drag in the human turds that littered the marble floors. Most of these were frozen solid, but a few were not, and in the dim galleries, she could not see the steam rising from these until it was too late. Okay, I'll leave it there. It's tough to pick out a piece from, from this series um, that's not going to be completely bamboozling, but I hope you enjoyed that description of somebody writing a very, very long number with a quill. And, um, and uh you know, obviously the, 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 the stuff about Eliza lactating might, might hit you in the left, left field, but she's a woman and um, she's navigating this world and she's also unmarried and she's had an illegitimate child, but she's passing it off as an adopted child. So, um, you know, uh, imagine trying to navigate that and the financial world intrigue uh, doesn't begin to cover it. Eliza is not the only character. Um, there are dozens, dozens of, of, of characters in this, and they all play crucial roles in the historical events that are described. It's fantastic stuff. Three books, about a thousand pages each. Cryptonomicon's about a thousand pages. I don't know how quickly you could read that. Reading through this whole cycle, if I decide to tackle it when I had, used to have a bit more time, used to take me, you know, about approximately a year you know like uh in the times that i got to read and boy what a pleasure it was to read through them uh the 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 links that he manages to draw between where's my hand pointing between cryptonomicon in the 20th century and these books which take place largely around the 17th century it it starts to build up a web of connections between the historical eras that starts to feel really weighty and really um really uh you start to feel this sort of emotional weight of the of the of the the the, the progress of history and how things are connected um yeah and and that's a, that's a glorious feeling in my opinion that's a glorious feeling it really makes you feel connected to the through line of history um and and given that he connects these type of events in the 17th century all the way through using cryptonomicon to the advent of computing, then it connects us right here and now uh, to these events. And the, some of the stuff that these characters go through is bloody horrendous, but history marches on. So it gives me that feeling that, you know, um, it gives me a, an appreciation from, from my ancestors, your ancestors, everybody who, who got, went through these things and got us to this point. It, it gives me an appreciation for what they did for us. And it also encourages me to try in my own small way to do the same, to, to get through whatever travails and trials and tribulations we've got ahead of us, get through it so that we can, we can contribute another step to the march of civilization, not the destruction of civilization, not the continual critique and continual demoralization of civilization, but the actual structure of civilization for the benefit of, of everybody. Okay, that's the Baroque cycle. We read from Cryptonomicon. You have to read, <laughs> I'm laying down rules now. You have to read Cryptonomicon first. But once you get through that, if you enjoy it, you can get onto these insane, weighty, wonderful, um, fun, but um, super involving and emotionally moving and educational and exciting uh, books here. All right. That's enough for now. I'm going to find the stop button. Thanks for listening. And, uh, and in case the message is unclear or in case I've put you off with my own thoughts and nonsense about this, I hope the message is still clear. Read Cryptonomicon 
and then read the Baroque cycle. You will love it. It's a, it's a 12 out of 10. Thanks heaps.